Hello and welcome to chapter 3. This is Professor Farhad. In this chapter, we're going to be working with the DuPont identity today. So in this chapter, we looked at the cash flow statement. We look at the standardized financial statements. We look at the ratio analysis. And now we're going to look at the DuPont analysis. So in this chapter, we're going to focus more on the DuPont analysis, which is a ratio. And if you're thinking, well, we just learned some ratio earlier. Absolutely. It's going to be basically uh, taking the ratio that we learned earlier, but manipulating the ratios a little bit more. Now you might be asking, why are we going to have to do this? Well, the reason we do it is because the DuPont identity, it's going to tell us the competitive advantage of the company. Competitive advantage, or for that matter, disadvantage. It's going to tell us where's the company really doing well, on which cylinder they're doing very well, on, on which areas they're not doing very well. But that's going to tell us the competitive advantage. What are they doing well? From what perspective? From what from what analytical perspective? So it's basically a ratio. And we're going to be looking. We're going to be break, breaking down the DuPont identity into three components. Just want to let you know, you could break it down into more components, into five or six. But we're going to break it down into three to see how it works. So we're going to start by looking at return on equity which we learn about in the prior session and what is return on equity it's net income divided by total equity now bear in mind i talked about in the prior session that you're supposed to if, if it's a balance sheet account you're supposed to use the average equity not ending equity because net income happens throughout the year because net income is for a period of time and the balance sheet equity is a point in time so you want them to be both covering the same period. Therefore, you want to take beginning equity plus ending equity divided by two. But for our purposes for this course, we don't do this. But just, I just want to let you know if you're watching this so you know that that's why we use the average because we you want both to be for a period of time. So what you do is you take the equity and you calculate the average equity. This way, it factors the same period as net income. Okay. So, but, it, but basically, what is return on equity? Basically, return on equity, what we learned about earlier, how much return is generated for each shareholder for each shareholder that's basically what it is so if income is 100 and we have equity of 100 then 10 percent okay so this is basically a simple um, example what we're going to do now we're going to take return on equity and we're going to decompose it basically we're going to uh, break it down into various components so it tells us a little bit more about the company it tells us a little bit more about the company and about its competitive advantage so if we take this equation return on equity then what we do we're going to multiply it by one and multiply it by one means multiplying it by the same numerator and denominator and we're going to multiply it we're going to choose to multiply it by assets so it doesn't matter what assets are for the company if assets are 100 or assets are 100 million dividing assets by assets will give you the number one and you know if you multiply something by one it's going to give you the same answer so we're not really changing the answer okay so we're going to multiply it by asset divided by asset that we're going to do next we're going to just rearrange the formula and basically we're going to switch to do the denominator we're going to switch the denominator and once we re rearrange the formula it's going to give us net income divided by assets and assets divided by equity so all what we did we still have we should still have the same answer i think it's better to work with some numbers it's better to work with some numbers so let's assume uh, we have revenues equal to 1000 expenses equal to 900 so net income equal to 100 and we have a balance sheet we have assets equal to liabilities plus equity and we're going to say on the balance sheet we have 10,000 in assets equal to liabilities of uh, let's make it 6,000 and let's make equity 4,000 let's make equity 4,000 okay so now if we started with the first equation net, net income divided by equity if we take net income which is 100 divided by equity happens to be uh, in, th in this situation 4,000 let me change net income a little um, let's make net income equal to 500 so I'm gonna change this so we have some number to work with 
a bit, little bit bigger ratio. So what we're going to do, we're going to start by looking at return on equity. And let's take 500 divided by 4,000. And that's equal to 12.5. Equal to 12.5%. 12.5%. Now, after we manipulated the equation, let's make sure it still holds. Net income equal to 500. Assets equal to 10,000. Assets equal to 10,000 and total equity equal to 4,000. Let's do the same thing again. If we take, if we take 500, sorry, just, okay. If we take 500 divided by 10,000, that's equal to 0 0.05. And if we take 10,000 divided by 4,000, that's equal to 2.5. 2.5 times 0 0.05, that's going to give me 12.5%. I did this to show you that we still have return on equity equal to 12.5 after we multiply it by the total assets and rearrange the formula. Now, we're going to now talk about those two ratios a little bit further. What is asset divided by equity? What is asset divided by equity? If you remember this, what do we call this ratio from the prior session? We call this ratio the equity multiplier. So this ratio tells us basically to, to a degree how much of our assets are financed from debt, how much of our assets are financed from equity. And let me start with a simple example. Let me rearrange let me just use different numbers here. If we have assets equal to 10,000, liabilities of zero plus 10,000 of equity, if we take 10,000 divided by 10,000, the multiplier equal to one. Multiplier equal to one, it means what? It means we have no debt. Notice we have no debt. Okay? Now, obviously, if we have zero debt. Now, what we have in this example, we have something else. We have 10,000 divided by 4,000, that's going to give us 2.5. This is the equity multiplier. Now, I like to take the equity multiplier. I know I'm going to go step step further, kind of going backward, but that's how, that's how I like to look at the equity multiplier. I like to take 1 divided by 2.5, and that's going to give me 0.4 or 40%. What does that mean? It means the company, for every dollar in asset, it's relying on 40% from equity and obviously 60% from debt. Okay, I just like to take the equity multiplier and the one divided by the equity multiplier, and it's going to give me how much, how much of my assets are financed from equity. I just like to like to look at this ratio from this perspective. Okay, so now we know the equity multiplier is two point five, and we took net income divided by asset, and and it gave us five percent together. Give us twelve point five. Now. The, now, you have to remember, or we have to notice, the higher the equity multiplier, the higher the debt. And what do we call higher debt? We call this leverage, okay? So we're not really leveraged. We're, we're leveraged here, but not, you know, not, not very much. I mean, yes, we are. We have more than, we have more debt than equity, but, you know, some companies, they even have much, much more, okay? So 2.15 is not that bad. Now, Let's um, let's take a look at now focus on this first first uh, formula, and it says net income divided by asset. Do you remember what this ratio is? Net income divided by asset. Hopefully you remember. This is an effective use of resources. It's going to measure how effective are we using our assets to generate income. What, what are we saying here? A five hundred net income, ten thousand is assets. It means for every dollar in asset, we are generating five pennies in net income. That's what it's saying. It's how well we are using our assets to generate income. That's what, that's what it's showing us. Now, what we can do, if you really think about it, I'm going to bring down, uh, let, let me write down the formula here. So I'm just going to, so remember, we have net income divided by asset, which is we saw up here, which is the same one, which is 0 0.05. Then we have the equity multiplier for our example, 2.5, the equity multiplier. So we're going to just keep this on this side, the equity multiplier. And I'm going to decide to multiply this equation by sales divided by sales, also multiplying the numbers by one. 
sales divided by sales is one. Again, if you multiply anything by one, it's gonna give you the same answer. Now, for our purposes, sales is, for our example, revenues or sales is 1,000. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take 1,000 divided by 1,000. And you know what's gonna happen next? I'm gonna go ahead and switch the, the denominator. I'm gonna go ahead and switch the denominator and I'm gonna rearrange this formula. And it's gonna be sales divided by assets. That's formula one. Net income divided by sales. And I'm gonna keep assets divided by equity, which is the equity multiplier. So I'm gonna take those three and multiply them. That's all what I just did. All what I did is I only rearrange this part of the formula, basically switch the denominator. I'm allowed to do that. And if I'm allowed to do that, when I do everything, it should equal to 12.5. And let's make sure it's equal to 12.5 before we proceed. So we have sales of a thousand, assets of 10,000. We have net income of 500 and we have sales of a thousand. Wow, that's pretty good company. And the equity multiplier um, assets are 10,000 and equity is 4,000. So let's go ahead and try to find now the answers. 1,000 divided by 1,000 equal to 0 .1, 0 0.1 times 500 divided by 1,000. Wow, that's pretty good, 0.5 or 50%. Then this is 2.5. And if, if we multiply this, it should, I hope it's gonna give us 12.5. It should give us 12.5. So 0 0.1 times 0 0.5 times 2.5 equal to, as I expected, 12.5%. So all what I did is I took my return on equity and what I did really, I broke it down into three component that's gonna give me more information about the company. I'm gonna explain each component separately. Okay, so sales divided by asset. What is that figure? That's the asset turnover. So this formula is the asset turnover. And what is the asset turnover? It's telling, it's telling me how much profit, I'm sorry, how much sales, not profit, generated from each one dollar, how, how much sales is generated uh, from each one dollar in assets? And the answer is 10 cents. So for every dollar I have an asset, I'm generating 10 pennies, 10 pennies in sales, okay? So this is asset turnover, that's the first ratio. The second ratio, remember I said I'm gonna break it down into three components. The second is this one right here, net income divided by sales. And what is this ratio? This ratio is the net profit margin or just the profit margin, profit margin. And this, what is this ratio telling me? It's telling me my bottom line, my profit for $1 in sales. And it's pretty good, it's 50 cent. That's very, very good, okay? That's extremely good. I should have used a more realistic number, but that's fine. So now, for every dollar in sales, I'm generating 50 pennies in profit, which is very, very good. So tell me, it tells me how much profit I'm making. And in the third component, it's gonna tell me, basically this is the multiplier, the equity multiplier, how much of my assets are financed from that, how much of the assets are financed from equity. And what we said is, interpreted in another way, 40% are coming from that. I'm sorry, 40% are coming from equity by taking one divided by 2.5. I just like to reverse it. And this means 60% is coming from that. And the higher the debt, the higher this ratio. And the higher this ratio, the higher my leverage. The higher, and the higher is my leverage, the higher is my risk, and the higher is my reward. So what I did, I took the, I, I took the, I took return on equity, and I technically broke it down into three components to figure out where is the company making the profit. So if, if I'm looking at this fictitious company, what do I say? Well, I say the company is not selling a lot 
from their assets. I mean, generally speaking, they're not, okay? Only 10 cent per every dollar in asset. But what, what are they doing good? They're doing good by their profit margin. Their profit margin is extremely well. So this looks like a jewelry store. A jewelry store, they don't sell a lot. But when they sell, their profit margin is extremely high, which is not as high as 50% as profit margin, but just to exaggerate. So what we say this company is, is uh, their competitive advantage is their profit margin. It seems they're selling something unique that they can command high prices and they can keep a lot of profit. And their equity multiplier is 2.5. Now another company, another other company could have could have 12.5 as return on equity, but what happened is they could have a different numbers. They could have a different numbers. So they could have a high asset turnover, a low profit margin, and equity multiplier, it doesn't matter. But the point is, or different equity multiplier that's gonna give them 12.9. They could be highly leveraged, which is more than 2.5. Okay, so this is the point to remember from a DuPont analysis. It's going to tell you what is the company doing well, on which cylinder it's it's doing well. And this is what we did. Okay. So for proof rock, it was 14.1, which is I did the analysis, so I'm not going to go over it again. So let me just kind of uh, just summarize. So the DuPont tells us that ROE is affected by three things. Operating efficiency, as measured by profit margin, which is net income divided by sales. Asset use efficiency, how well we're using, how well we are using our assets. And the third one is the financial leverage, how much we are relying on debt versus equity, debt versus equity. Those are the three things. One, two and three and different companies will have different advantage you cannot have high profit margin and high asset turnover and at least if you have it you're going to have it for a short period of time you're going to have it and this is sales divided by assets and if if you're going to have it you're going to have it for a short period of time okay and the financial leverage your financial leverage depending on your capital structure are you relying more on assets are you relying more on equity so on and so forth okay weakness in either operating or asset use of efficiency or or both will show up in, in a diminished return on asset which will translate in lower roe so if you have weakness in either or both if you have weakness in both it means you're not selling a lot and when you sell you're not making good profit which you're, you're really in good shape i'm sorry you, you you're in bad shape okay Considering the DuPont identity, it appears that ROE could be leveraged up by increasing the amount of debt by the firm. So how can we increase our return on equity? We could increase our debt. However, notice that increasing debt also increase interest expense, which in turn reduce profit margin, which act to reduce ROE. So again, if you have more debt, you have more interest expense. Interest expense would reduce your profit, which would lower your profit margin. So ROE could go up or down depending so that's of course more important the use of debt financing has a number of other effects as we discuss at some length which we'll discuss later on the amount of leverage is governed by its capital structure policy which i just mentioned so what's the purpose of the uh, basically the 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 composition of roe let's just take a look at the decomposition of roe and maybe we'd look at an example a more realistic example from the real world just to see how it works so the decomposition of ROE we have discussed in this section is a convenient way of systematically approaching financial statement analysis if ROE unsatisfactory by some measure then DuPont identity tells us where to start looking for reasons so this tells us what is the problem in the company is it their turnover they're not selling a lot or is it they're selling but they're, they're not making profit or is it they're not really leveraged they're not taking advantage of the scale of that that they can use gm provides a good example how dupont analysis can be very useful and also illustrate why care must be taken in interpreting roe in all ratios you have to take care. you have to be very careful when you're doing the interpretation in 1989 gm had an roe of 12.1 but 1993 roe has improved to 44 percent a dramatic improvement okay a closer inspection however we find that over the same period gm profit has declined from 3.4 to 1.8 well 
and ROA has declined from 2.4 to 103 to 1.3. The decline in ROI was moderated only slightly by an increase in total asset turnover. That's the only thing that helped. That helped. Okay, given this information, how is it possible for GM return on equity to have climbed so sharply? From, from our understanding of the DuPont identity, it must be the case that GM equity multiplier increased substantially. So this is important. So when we looked at, when we looked at ROE, it improved, but return on asset went down and their profit margin went down. So what went up is their equity multiplier. And what do we mean by equity multiplier? The use of more debt. They're using more debt. In fact, what happened was that GM book equity value was almost wiped out overnight in 1982 by changing in the accounting treatment of pension liabilities. If a company, so what happened is there was a change in the how we account for pensions and pensions need to be recorded on the books. And once the pension are recorded on the books, pension is a liabilities, your debt goes up. And when your debt goes up, your equity multiplier goes up as well. So if a company uses equity value, if the company, if the company's equity value declines sharply, its equity multiplier rises. So if the equity went down in comparison to the debt, obviously the debt goes up, then your equity multiplier goes up. In GM case, so this is what happened in GM, the multiplier went from 4.95 to 33.62. So the equity multiplier is what improved their ROE, not their effort, not, not their selling effort, not their profitability. In sum, the dramatic improvement was almost entirely due to accounting change that affected the equity multiplier and did not really represent an improvement in financial performance. So I, I hope you could see this clearly, that ROE improved, but really the company is not doing well. They had to add more liabilities because in 1992, companies had to put their pension liability on the balance sheet, which in turn increased their, increased their debt relative to their equity, which in turn increased their equity multiplier. And I'm pretty sure it happened across all other companies. So let's look just one more example, DuPont analysis. And now we're gonna look at Yahoo and we're gonna look at Google. We're gonna look at Yahoo, we're gonna look at Google. Um, so this is maybe, it will bring it a little bit closer to home. It help us interpret this ratio. So ROE in 2013 was 10.4% for Yahoo, 14.8% for Google. So Google is doing better in 2013, but let's see where in what area notice the profit margin for yahoo is 29 the profit margin for google is 21. it means yahoo is keeping more profit for every dollar in sales so yahoo is beating on the profit margin level total asset turnover 27.9 53.9 however google is selling more for every dollar in asset google is selling more then the equity multiplier is almost the same for both. They don't have a lot of that. Notice 1.29, they don't have a lot of that, both of them. We look at 2012, we should, we should have started with 2011, but it doesn't matter. The profit margin for Google was lower and the profit margin for, uh, Go I'm sorry, for, for Yahoo was lower and for Google almost the same, but now it's more comparable with Yahoo. Again, still, that persistence, Google is selling more for every dollar in sales. So the asset turnover, Google is beating them. And the equity multiplier, once again, for both of them is not that important. Um, although Google is relying a little bit more on that. In, in 2011, we should have started from that. The profit margin for uh, Google was even higher than Yahoo. Higher than Yahoo, then Yahoo started to increase their profit margin. But again, as you can see, um, Google is selling more, selling more as as total of their assets. And this is where Google is beating Yahoo. They sell much, much more and they're taking away their lunch. Basically, that's what's happening. Google, starting in 2011, they're starting to eat up their lunch, Yahoo's profit. Actually, before that, but over time, and this, and this asset turnover is increasing over time as Google is gaining, gaining more ad, ad on the internet, taking away uh, sales revenue from from uh, from Google as well as from everybody else. Okay, now we could also look at an expanded Dupont analysis. As I told you, Dupont analysis can be broken down into many components. We break it down into those three main components, but 
this is a balance sheet and an income statement. So if it's in your book, just look at it. And we're going to look at this, go from these numbers. So this is the net income we're going to be starting with. So basically, let me just capture this because we're going to look at the expanded analysis of DuPont. We're not, we're not going to really look at, we're not going to go into details, but we're going to look at it. We're going to look at, we're going to use a net income, starting with net income, total asset, what else? Sales and equity. We're going to start with those four figures and we're going to break things down a little bit further. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is the expanded DuPont analysis. So let me just, okay. Using the numbers above, you could you could work the calculation, but let's go ahead and show you how it works. And you need to know how the accounts affect each other. So for example, we look at this company and we see the return on equity, starting with return on equity is 29.87. Remember, return on equity can be broken down into the equity multiplier times return on asset. So their equity multiplier is 3.17. Their equity multiplier is 3.17, which is basically assets divided by equity. So they're using more of debt. So they have they have more debt than equity, which is all have to do is divided one divided by 3.17, and you will find out the equity ratio. But they're using more debt. Then return on asset is 9.41. Now we're going to take return on asset. And return on asset it can be broken down into two components as we saw earlier it can be broken down into the profit margin and it can be broken down in the total asset turnover and the profit margin is what is net income divided by sales and total asset turnover is sales divided by assets so the profit margin is 12.71 multiplied by their asset turnover 0.74 and this is where we stop in our analysis okay basically we said the three components are the equity multiplier profit margin and total asset turnover. Take those three, multiply them together, you will get return on equity. Now, if you wanna go a little bit further, you could go a little, much, little bit more further. You could say, well, what is profit margin? Profit margin is really net income, okay? Uh, uh, net income divided by sales. Net income divided by sales is the formula for profit margin. And what is net income? Net income is sales minus cost of goods sold. Sales minus cost. What is cost? Cost is cost of goods sold, depreciation, selling general administrative interests and taxes. So let's focus on the profit margin. If you want to improve your profit margin, what should you do? Well, you should do one of two things. Either increase your sales, or actually three things, increase your sales, reduce your cost, or a combination of both. And by reducing cost, how do you reduce your total cost? By reducing all your other costs, any cost you would reduce, any cost that you would reduce, what's going to happen? It's going to Im improve your net income. And as it improves your net income, it's going to improve your profit margin. As it improves your profit margin, it's going to improve your return on equity. Okay? Or you could also increase your sales. It will do the same. It will do the same trick. Going back to total asset turnover, total asset turnover is sales divided by total assets. How could you improve this ratio? Increase, obviously, your sales or reduce your assets or a combination of both. And what are total assets? Total assets are current assets plus fixed asset. And current assets, you have cash, you have inventory and receivable. What you wanna do, you wanna reduce those. Any reduction of those, any reduction of those, it's gonna re reduce your total asset, in turn, in increase your asset turnover, in turn, increase your return on equity. So this picture shows you the effect of each item on the balance sheet on the whole, on the whole, on the whole equation, which is return on equity. And if you really think about it, it's common sense. What does that mean? Reduce expenses, increase sales, reduce assets, and increase your leverage. Increase your leverage. Increase your debt. Your equity multiplier will go up. All of those will do what? Will increase your return on equity. But the DuPont, it shows, it to, it shows them to you in separate component, which is it's extremely important because it's gonna give you, it's gonna give you a total picture of what is going on. And this is basically the, you know, the DuPont identity, which is extremely important to be careful when you're interpreted because as you saw from the GM example, the, the return on equity went up, but it has to do with increasing their pension liability due to the an accounting change from FASB.
And this is all for the DuPont identity. I know it, 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 you know, I explain it a little bit more in details, but this is what I wanted to do. The next thing we look at is using financial statement information. Make sure to read the book. And if you have any questions, by all means, email me or see me in class.